Hello and welcome to Unprofessional Engineering. My name is James. And you got Luke. Luke, we've already done the 1920s, but this time we're looking at the inventions of the 1930s. This one was better than I thought. And just, just a little background, those of you that don't know like what happened in like the 30s, like this was literally like the Great Depression era. Uh -huh. Like, you know, the Dust Bowl, like this was this was not a time in at least American history where things were going well. So uh, I was really surprised. I kind of thought that there would be fewer significant inventions. Yeah. Um, I mean, th there were some real significant ones. A lot of them were just kind of like, you know, crappy ones. Uh, but some were pretty impressive considering the time. Considering the time, I agree. I thought overall the 20s, I liked the inventions more. But as you put that into perspective for me, it does make sense. And there are some good ones on here. So what do you think is number one or your first one you want to talk about, Luke? So, oh, okay, so do we do, do number one or chronological? I can go do either chronological, way. Chronological, that's fine. Okay, okay I'll, so. I'll tell you my favorite at the end. Okay, so the, inter the probably the most interesting one, um, at least in 1930. So, uh, and there were a couple of discrepancies with yeah. 20s and 30s. Uh, but the one I have to go with that literally, I probably use maybe not a daily basis, but in 1930, uh, an engineer by the name of Richard G. Drew with 3M invented, Drew. Yes. invented scotch tape. That's like, a biggie. How bananas is that in 1930 they were inventing scotch tape? So I don't. So, so question: Are you or your wife the rapper of presence in the family? Um. No, not that kind of rapper. I I guess it's it, it depends. So she does the majority of the rapping. Okay. But I'm actually good at it. Okay. She might as well just like <laughs> crinkle up the paper and like ball it up. It's terrible, but I'll actually like fold corners and stuff. Oh, like I, so I almost take pride in how my rapping ability. And whenever I had younger nephews and nieces, I would actually tape the seams completely. Oh boy. Like, unless you get like a fingernail underneath so it it's or a an knife, effort. Like, yeah. you can't open it. Like you're sitting there scratching at it and scratching at it. So that was like yeah. one of my favorite things to do as an uncle was to completely seal up the corners uh, with scotch tape. But I use it probably every day. So, uh, so yeah, so 1930. Yeah. And that's probably, I'm gonna say now, just looking at my list, I didn't put them in rank order. That's gotta be like top five for me for the 1930s easily. Yeah, uh, I thought it was interesting. I saw for sure not from Wikipedia a few things on this uh, where like he got inspired from watching auto engineers try and achieve like a smooth paint on two color cars, which is kind of mm -hmm. weird. Uh, but also that like we think about it and, it, you know, you get it in the little plastic thing, you rip it off, whatever. The little plastic dispenser didn't happen until another 3M engineer made it in 1932 which is cool. And they found that because of how diverse this th that scotch tape is, it was like really started to boom during the Great Depression because it could be used for like anything. And fun fact, one of those anythings is that Goodyear would use scotch tape to support the ribs of their blimps that were flying to prevent corrosion on them. That's interesting. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah, that's just what I want holding my blimp together is <laughs> scotch, scotch tape. tape. <laughs> yeah. But uh, interesting stuff. What's your next one? My next one, boy, I have so many, and mine are not in chronological order. Uh, but I am going to go ahead and choose the jet engine. Did you see the jet engine on this? I list? saw that it was invented, but not tested. So I left it off of my list. So I'll let you okay. roll with this one. Sure. So they started doing some work with it in 1928, which I guess is a little bit of cheating, but it was Frank Whittle who formally submitted his ideas for the turbojet um, to all of his boys. And in October of 29, he developed on that idea further. By January of 1930, uh, he's an English dude, uh, he submitted his first patent for it, which got granted in 1932. So in my opinion, this is a 1930s discovery. Um, it showed a two-stage axle compressor, which fed into a single-sided centrifugal compressor. 
And this was just like groundbreaking technology for the time. This has to be one of the biggest inventions that came out of the 30s. Uh, but at the, in 1935, a guy by the name of Hans von Ohain started to do something similar in Germany, right? And it was claimed like, hey, yeah, this dude never saw Whittle's uh, patent. He had nothing to do with it. And Whittle was like, all right, I believe you. But Whittle's son was like, you know, calling him out like, that's BS, man. You for sure saw my dad's patent. And years later, I'm assuming on his deathbed, Hans von Ohain was like, yeah, so maybe I saw that patent and kind of kind of took that idea as my own. So uh, two dudes get a bit of the credit. Frank Whittle seems to be the guy for the jet engine, though. I thought so. So this is by far my number one. Oh, OK. And, it, and it's an early one. So OK. Uh, so a German electrical engineer is credited with inventing the first electron microscope. So 1931. I saw that. And this is Ernest Ruska, R-U-S-K-A. Yeah, Ruska. Uh, and it looked like there was a co-inventor by the name of uh, Max. Max. Not yeah. No. With, with a K. Oh, no. <laughs> There's me. There's Close. me. In, there's me in my reading capacity. Uh, <laughs> So it was first commercialized, uh, or it was, first, it was developed in 1931 and then commercialized um, and mass produced still in the 30s, so 1939. And the interesting thing is this was used, I mean, it, it, huge in if you just think what it has done for medicine. Like if you think about oh, like yeah. what they're studying, you know, viruses, protein, molecules, I mean, just about anything so much so uh that ruska was awarded in 1986 the nobel prize for physics um for That's their nuts. contribution um to the uh, the microscope so uh pretty impressive i mean and if you just think about like if they didn't have microscopes like we would still be like bleeding people whenever they got sick and like <laughs> you know in doing like don't terrible do no like doing terrible met like putting leeches on you and all these crazy uh, procedures because they just didn't have the capacity to to look at that kind of molecular level and so all the contributions this has to be my number one thing for the 30s it it's a good one uh i did see uh siemens was really involved with kind of like the advancement of the electron mm -hmm. microscope, getting patents and then taking it to that next stage of being useful for all of those things that you were just talking about. Very cool. Uh, let's see, what should my next one be? There's so many like legitimate ones. And then there are so many that I'm kind of like, oh, these are fun. I'm going to go with a fun one next, Luke. What do you got? Invented in Schiller Park, Illinois on April 6th of 1930 by James Alexander Dwar. He was a Canadian born baker from the Continental Baking Company. Where are you going with this? Twinkies. Oh, Twinkies oh, were invented. So this, the story about it was really interesting. So he noticed that like all these machines that they used to make Twinkies, which were originally filled with strawberry filling so it was like a strawberry shortcake they would sit there not being used when strawberries were out of season so dude was like you know what we should do is fill these suckers with banana cream and he dubbed them twinkies um and so i guess they were named after some billboard that somebody saw that said twinkle toe shoes and they liked that so they went with that but during world war ii bananas were rationed and so the company couldn't like make the banana filling for them anymore. So they switched over to vanilla cream. And it turns out that the vanilla cream is way better than gross banana cream. And so that's what they stuck with. And banana cream was not really introduced ever again. And here we have it, Twinkies as we know and love them today. I gotta say, I'm a fan of like a banana cream filled Twinkie. Uh, no, nah, man, no way. Really? I'm not interested. I'm so, also, I'm a ho-ho guy anyways, but okay. you know. I'm a Twinkie, but I, the, I, like, I feel like the, va I feel like the vanilla cake and banana. Uh, I would oh. try it, but I don't think I would like it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Before we move on, Luke, I think we need to take a quick, quick break 
for a word from our sponsor. I have to assume whoever makes Twinkies nowadays. I don't know who it is. It used to be Hostess, but I think they went out of business. Uh, something like Some, that. Someone bought them, though. No, we have no sponsor, <sighs> which is probably a surprise to everyone. It is a surprise. But we do have some shout outs. Who do we got? First, we have Mike F. First off, I love this show. I just discovered it, and I'm only on episode 20. So he's never even met you yet, Luke. Um, I took a brief look through the episodes, and I may have missed it, but I'm really surprised you guys haven't covered the large hydraulic presses that the Nazis had in World War II. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, That's Mike. very I mean, specific. Large Nazi hydraulic presses is a no-brainer, Luke, and I blame you completely for not having it on our list. So there's that. Wow. But I did add it on our list, Mike, so thank you for the Nazi compressors or hydraulic presses. Uh, next, we have Charles H. Love your podcast. A lot of love today. I like it. Uh, not an engineer, but hoping to go back to school for ME eventually. I build race cars for a living, which is basically unprofessional engineering. Would love some stickers for my toolbox. So you know what, Charles? You are for sure getting some stickers eventually, but even more for sure, more of an engineer than Luke and I combined because building race cars is like legit stuff. And I mean, look at us, we don't know what we're doing. So good job, keep up the good work on those race cars. If any of you would like a shout out, probably get your email ignored because I'm really bad at it. If you'd like some stickers, if you want to just send some love, go ahead and email us at unprofessionalengineering at gmail.com. And don't forget to subscribe, like, review. And as always, you can tell your smart devices to play the Unprofessional Engineering Podcast anytime. And if you want to become like the fifth person to buy an Unprofessional Engineering t-shirt, head on over to unprofessionalengineering.com and check out all of our goods on the store. For the record, audience, fans, I feel like James is lying to me because he he, he did this store kind of on his own and just kind of made it, which I love that you did that. Great initiative, you. right? You're Thanks. the prez, so I, I get am. it. Um, <laughs> you're probably making like hundreds of thousands of dollars off of our t-shirt sales more than and, more than that my man and i and i see none of it because i'm just in the dark just throwing it out there living in squalor because you aren't getting living profits. in squalor <laughs> what's up next all righty my next one this one's got to be a pretty <laughs> big one too so this I'm, I'm jumping a little bit forward to 1933 and a cat by the name of edwin howard armstrong invents eddie. yeah eddie uh invents none other than the fm radio transmission oh, that's a good one yeah yeah this one's pretty good so he received a patent for wideband fm on december 26 1933 he conducted the first large scale large scale field test of fm radio technology he was on the mm. 85th floor of the rca building oh that's um, cool uh, or, uh, uh, 85th floor of RCA in the Empire State Building yeah. uh, when he did this. Um, interestingly, uh, RCA was more interested in television broadcasting, and they chose oh. not to buy the patent to the FM technology. You know, businesses don't always make great decisions. I know. And <laughs> so, so this, for me, this has got to be, I don't know, probably number two or three for me because if you think of it's up there. like how like as a kid listening to the radio like the way people you know consume their news there's there's another one that ties in later on with the radio uh later on in the 30s but it just it, it has such impact on communication and oh, connecting yeah. people and so just a really great thing interestingly the very first thing that was played uh was a jazz record Oh, how about that? You don't know what one? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't see the one specifically. No, nah, I don't. all good. Um, I thought it was interesting. See, I don't know much about FM, AM, all that stuff, but they said that FM broadcasting has like higher fidelity. And so that means like more accurate reproduction of like the sound that you're trying to distribute out there. Mm -hmm. And it's also like less susceptible to like interference and static and all that popping that you get on the AM stations. And so that's why it's so much better. Interesting stuff, Luke. Interesting stuff. Very. Uh, next for me, this is probably the biggest. I'm stealing it. I'm going with this one. Oh. Nuclear fission of heavy yeah, elements. Yeah, I got, I got, I got that's, that's, that, that, it's, it's up there. It, it's good. May 19th, this, 
May 19th of December of 38, a German chemist, Otto Hahn, always with the Germans, and his assistant, Fritz, that's a good name, Fritz Strassmann, uh, in cooperation with Austrian-Swedish physicist, Lies Meitner. I think I think I got that right. Yeah, anyway, yeah, you nailed it. Han here understood that a burst of the atomic nuclei had occurred that they were checking out. Uh, and then Meitner explained it theoretically in 39, along with his nephew, Otto Robert Frisch. And so Frisch named the process um, by analogy with biological fission of living cells and how those things work. And then, you know, they went on to explain how nuclear fission actually behaves and works. And from there, maybe not them, but everyone in the science community then began to understand and learn how we could leverage that for, I, I, I want to say clean energy. We'll go with cleanish energy. How about that? Um, clean-ish. I, yeah. I, I mean, it, it's, it's definitely, I mean, when you think about like, oil and gas and carbon emissions and all those sorts. I mean, as long as you don't have a meltdown, right? <laughs> as, Just so you don't have a meltdown. As long fine. as you don't have a Fukushima or uh, Three Mile Island or Chern Chernobyl, say that. Check out our episode on Chernobyl. Um, mm -hmm. As long as that doesn't happen, it's relatively safe. I'm with you. What do you think should be next to talk about? Okay, so this one is uh, probably near and dear to your heart, James. I'm sure it is. Near and dear. 1935, any guesses? January 24th on a cool stormy day. I, I, I like it. I don't know what it is though. The American Can Company cans the first beer with oh. Gottfried Kruger Brewing Company. I didn't uh, see this. They put together 2000 cans of Kruger's finest ale, uh, the sale. Kruger Cream Ale. Um, uh, and like this was, well, you don't drink. So, so well, I used to cream, drink. Cream ales are interesting. So I, I, I don't mind them. Um, okay. but yeah, so this is done in, uh, Richmond, Virginia. Um, and before this, like everybody was drinking out of glass, either pop tops or like growlers are like all the rage nowadays with all the hipsters, but yeah. growlers are what they would use back in the day. Like it, it, like to be able to take a six pack or a can and take it home and put it in your fridge. Um, so, uh, I thought, I thought you would like this one. And I thought this I one do. was pretty significant because, you know, I mean, if you think about the beer industry in itself and just like the food and beverage it's not industry, small. Yeah. um, you know, it, it's something that, um, number one allows for, you know, safe consumption of not just beer, but all liquids it, you know, yeah. they can preserve it. They can ship it. They can transport it. It allows for easier distribution. Like it, it makes things it a whole lot easier. Less, less. It's skunky less. Yeah. 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 I like it. So, I think that was a great choice. I don't know how I don't have that on my list. Yeah. Well it's, done. I mean, for me, it's, it's probably top 10, not for the beer purpose, but for just like but, general food preservation sure. and all that sort of stuff. Check out our episode on food preservation. So um, I'm going to give a shout out to there. It's called, uh, it, it, it's, it's called hop lark. So hop it's a lark. It's a carbonated beverage with a uh, tea and hops but they don't ferment the hop, so it doesn't produce alcohol. And it's, they're literally, cause you know, I don't drink, but it tastes just like a really good hoppy beer. Yeah. And it's like my new favorite thing to do um, on weekends. I've not so heard of such a thing. If you're, Did... yeah. If you're looking at like a non-alcoholic way to have a good tasting, not beer, it's really good. Totally unrelated. I apologize, listeners. Did you ever get one of those nitro brew coffee things? No, I, I was going to. Wasn't one of, wasn't one of our dogs going to hook you up with some yeah, great deal? Yeah, he was supposed to give me a deal. And I, I, I think they went out Jerk. of business, unfortunately. Uh, I haven't, glad I they didn't give them. you a deal then. Okay, yeah. um, I'm going to do one more before we take another quick break. Cool, My yeah. next one is the Zippo Lighter. And I'm That's stealing this one. one for selfish purposes again. So American inventor George G. Blasdell which apparently not named Zippo, founded Zippo Manufacturing Company in 1932 and produced the first Zippo lighter in early 1933. And so he was inspired by Austrian cigarette lighters that had a similar design by M I M C O was the name of the company. And this is so absurd. Um, Blaisdell liked the sound of the word zipper and Zippo sounds more modern. So that's how the company got named. 
because he likes the sound of the word zipper. So I thought that was a little odd. Have you ever visited the Zippo factory? Well, fun fact, Luke, Zippo Manufacturing Company is in Bradford, Pennsylvania, which is basically a neighbor of lovely St. Mary's, Pennsylvania, which is home to one of the greatest podcast hosts of all time. <laughs> and so sure. I, I have, in fact, gone to the Zippo Manufacturing Company uh, facility. It's rather large and old looking and dirty. Yeah, but the, I, I think that's their primary manufacturing facility. Like they, mm -hmm. they employ like probably, I'm guessing hundreds, maybe thousands they, of people. They, they employ Bradford. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I visited Bradford like it was years and years and years ago. I don't probably more than like 30 years ago. And okay. what, what I found out interesting about Bradford because of like the geological location of Bradford, it's like one of the coldest places in North America. Oh, it's miserable. It's like the ice bowl, I think they call it. It's yeah, terrible. Because yeah. like the way it's shaped and like the way like the cold comes in and sits, like it's literally like has recorded some of the lowest temperatures, maybe not in Canada, but at least in um, like, like the United States. Con continental US. Yeah. yeah like, like the way it sits, crazy. like you're saying, the way it's shaped, it gets the Lake Erie lake effect weather. It gets New York's cold weather. It's terrible. Yeah. Don't go there, people. Yeah. Um, before we continue, Luke, we need, we need to take a break for this week's Luke's rant. Okay. So this is, I'm going to give a little bit of a, an homage to one, but I don't want to talk about it. So the Monopoly game was actually invented. I was kind of surprised by that one. It was invented in uh, 1934 by the cat by the name of Charles Darwo. Uh, I'm sorry. It was invented by a woman. He, he said he claimed, so there's some discrepancies. Okay. So, but we're we're, we're just going to say Charles Darwo probably stole it off of the woman that invented okay, it. Okay, And fair. because of the time and history, she probably didn't get credit, unfortunately, and he took the credit. Uh, that's jerk. fair. Yeah. Um, but like, so board games. So this is more like a question like I did at the beginning. So our, I found as a young kid that board games basically threw our family into enormous fights. Uh, mm, like, mm. I, I specifically remember taking the Monopoly game and f hitting the board and flipping all the pieces. I've done that with checkers and chess and uh, like pretty much any game you can play that's a board game, I have flipped the board because I'm <laughs> a sore loser. You and I feel, be. and like, the idea of board games is to like bring families together. Like, it, so it's more of a question for you, maybe our viewers, like, I think board games are nothing more than just like reasons for families to fight. Yeah, that's fair. So I'm a very poor loser as well, but my wife and I play board games together basically like, with like every other? weekend. Yeah, yeah. Just the I two have, of you. I have like hundreds of board games. That's weird. You, and you just sit and play a board game with your wife. We'll sit and play board games, yeah. That is weird. Yeah, that's like bonding. Um, but we Who never get that? in fights because I usually win. And she finds it really entertaining when I lose because I pout like a four-year-old, like horribly bad. Like you're talking about, like I haven't flipped a board with her yet, but like I'll like throw my cards on the table and be all pouting. But I completely agree, especially like Monopoly and a few others. They're just notorious like family fights. Because there's no skaters. skills. There's zero no, skill in that game. It's all luck. And then you just laugh at the other people. Yeah. Now, I introduced some skill into Monopoly when I was younger with my unique ways of stealing money from the bank to ensure that I wouldn't lose. Uh, but I did that a lot. Other other than that, I totally agree. With, You're yes. going to have to invite me and my wife over for board games. We, we could do that. We can make that happen. Now that everything's very complex over and... board games. Yes. Oh, oh yeah. No. Everything's better. I just got over COVID, but everything's better. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I just invited myself to your house. Cool. I love it. OK. Um, is your it next one. It is your turn. Oh, no, no, it's, no, it's, it's my your turn. turn. It's OK. Your turn. So this next one's pretty significant. Uh, so a Hungarian journalist. Uh -oh. Any clue yet? No, go ahead. Uh, named Laszlo Bar Laszlo ba Biro B I R O invented oh, the, the first pen. the first ballpoint pen in 1938. I think uh, I claimed that one in the 20s, or yeah, but I think that was somewhere. In, I don't yeah. remember where. Um, go ahead. So he noticed that the ink that they used on newspaper printing dried quickly, so leaving the paper smudge free. So he decided yeah. to create a pen using the exact same ink type, but a little bit thicker so that it would flow whenever it came out of oh, the flows. ballpoint pen. Oh, yeah. So yeah, the first I, ballpoint pen. I like it. I like it. Um, I'm going with 
one that's probably more significant to some folks than others. It goes by lysergic acid dithalamide. Do you know what that is, Luke? I am pleading the fifth, James. For those who are listening, it is commonly known as LSD. It is a hallucinogenic drug that we know nothing about that was first synthesized by a Swiss scientist in the 1930s during the Cold War. Um, the CIA conducted clandestine experiments with LSD and other drugs for mind control, information gathering, and other nefarious purposes. Uh, what's interesting is Albert Hoffman, um, the dude who like figured this all out, right? who is a researcher at this Sandoz company, Swiss chemical company, first developed LSD in 38. Um, he worked with a chemical found in funguses, which makes sense, and that grew naturally on rye and other grains. But he didn't know about the hallucinogenic effects of LSD until 1943, when he accidentally ingested a small amount of it and perceived, quote, extraordinary shapes with intense kaleidoscope play of colors. What do you do after that, Luke? And three days later, you do it again. You say, I need to take more of this stuff. And Hoffman rode his bike home from work uh, because of the restrictions of World War II tripping. And it was the first intentional acid trip that anyone had. So fun fact, Wow. years later, April 19th, has come to be celebrated by some recreational LSD users as a bicycle day, where they will, you know, do some LSD <laughs> take, and take ride their bicycles. Mm, wow. Yeah. That is, uh, I didn't realize it was accident. I always thought there was like some kind of military angle. Well, it was. That's what they used it for then. Yeah. To yeah. gather information and stuff. Don't do yeah. drugs, kids. Yeah, don't do drugs. Terrible. Especially that one. That's right. Okay. What's next? Luke? Okay. So this one is probably another big one for me. Uh, so September 14th, 1939, the VS 300. You, you, you with me? You got it? Oh, keep going. VS 300, the world's first practical helicopter oh, took flight in Stanford, huh. Connecticut. This was designed by a cat Connecticut. by the name of Igor Schwartzky. I can never say the name of the company. S I K O R S K I Skorsky. Yeah, I think Skorsky. Oh, I think you nailed it. Yeah. Uh, and he built it, uh, and it was built by Vaughn Skorsky Aircraft Division of the United Aircraft Corporation. Uh, it was tethered, so it didn't last too long. They want to make sure this thing doesn't like fly off into space. Um, and uh, he had the patent number one nine nine four four eight eight. And it was, uh, I mean, there's still, that name is still used for helicopters uh, to this day. So uh, I think that's a pretty interesting one. Um, it had a blade speed, which was super low compared to other ones, but the blade- it barely only, lifted. <laughs> it only rotated at 250 to 300 miles per hour. Um, obviously because, you know, this, you know, small engines and all the, the things that they didn't know. Um, so yeah, means- interesting one. That is a good one. I didn't know that one. Uh, next for me is radar, which is a pretty big one. So technically, like history of radar, researching all that might have started in like the 19th century, continued into the 20th. But when it really became functional and something that people, the government could take advantage of was in the like 1930s. So like 1934 to 1939, there were eight nations that ind- independently developed uh, radar. So the UK, Germany, United States, USSR, Japan, Netherlands, France, and Italy, all were developing this. Britain actually was nice and shared their information with the United States and its commonwealths like Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa. Uh, But radar was actually coined in 1939, the term, by the United States Signal Corps. Um, And these were systems that they then obviously used for the Navy. But radar, of course, is radio detection and ranging. So there you go. Apparently, radio is so important. The R and the A are used for radio. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. So how about that? 
Um, just a little bit more time, Luke. What do you have left? So I got one last one. I'm going to jump back a little bit. So this was 1938, and, and there's a little bit of kind of debate on this one. So, uh, and this is some of the worst stuff ever. Uh oh. Instant coffee. Oh no. Yeah. That so, doesn't deserve to be listed. No, it doesn't. Oh. But but we, we only have a little the bit of time. The process is cool. It is. So uh, so instant coffee, like originally was just, they would just take coffee grinds and just smash them up and you'd mix them in water and you would actually drink the coffee grinds themselves. Mm. Um, so so it's actually been that, around. That might be better, honestly. It actually probably is better. Oh. Uh, but the breakthrough came in 1937 when Nestle scientist Max Morgenthaler. Maxwell um, House. Yeah. <laughs> Max, oh, see, uh, invented a new instant coffee method, um, and the new product name be called uh, Nescafe. Um, it involved drying equal amounts of coffee extract and soluble carbohydrates, which makes a better tasting instant coffee and became very popular. So my father-in-law, love him to death. We go to their house for holidays, all the, and after dinner, having some pie, you want some coffee. I always fall for it and I say yes. And he goes and pulls out a jar of Sanka and boils some water. And, and it's just like, and I feel bad, but I, you know, I've been married 22 years. You're like, mm, over your I drink instant coffee like every holiday at his house. And it is so bad. At your house, are you a grind your own beans guy? Oh. I James, come on! Were. All I, I do, were. all I do is espresso. That's mm, all oh. I do. Americanos and lattes. Yeah, I don't even have a regular coffee machine. I have an espresso so machine. Oh, fancy! I am La fancy. Latte da. Okay, one more for me, and then I want to give some honorable mentions. Uh, the last one for me, Luke, is I saw differing times, but I'm going with 1938. The chocolate chip cookie oh was, no no yeah 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 no, it wasn't was that 38 that so i saw 1930 i saw 38 there were a bunch in there but yeah. american chefs ruth graves wakefield and sue brides were the two that did this uh they invented the recipe during a period when they owned the toll house I... in how great is that in okay. uh massachusetts That's, yeah yeah, that's so fantastic. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff you could look up about it, but the original recipe is in Toll House Tried and True Recipes. She actually, this is this is bananas. Um, they sold the recipe or gave the recipe, whatever you want to say, to Nestle because they were using the Nestle semi-sweet chocolate bars mm -hmm. to make the cookies. It was actually kind of an accident. They thought that the chocolate would melt and make them chocolate cookies, but they stayed in the chunk form and everybody loved them. But she gave, Wakefield gave the recipe to Nestle for these cookies and was paid with a lifetime supply of chocolate from the company. Fantastic deal. See, my wife would go for that, but like, I can only do so much chocolate. Oh, I think it's so funny that that's it. But the I Toll never, House connection. So I cool. never knew that it was called Toll House because of the inn that they ran. I did not know either. That is so cool. Yeah, I, I found I found 1939. So I I, I think okay. you're accurate with We're 1939. Okay. Um, a couple that I saw. The first color sound cartoon was done, uh, hmm. not by Walt Disney, but by. Iworks, who quit Disney and went and did that. Uh, the photocopier was a big one. Neoprene from DuPont. Check out our DuPont episode. Uh, da, 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 de, do. And then some others here. Braille was invented. The first uh, Volkswagen Beetle. Trampoline. Blood types. You mentioned Monopoly. The Richter scale. Parking the meters. Ri parking meter meters is a good 1932. one. 1932. Radio telescope. Uh, the radio antenna, the electric guitar, and, you know, for some of our listeners more than others, the first tampon was made in the 1930s, Luke. So Speaking of go. electric guitar, are you a Stranger Things fan? Absolutely. Do you and watch the, the final? Uh, yeah. I almost, so good. So I, I almost cried multiple times during that episode. It was really well done. I really good. enjoyed that. I thought this was the final season. Really excited that another one's coming. I so. thought it was too. And then my daughter told me there's another one. And I was like, thank goodness. But I got to yeah. wait like four years now. Oh, probably. yeah. It'll be forever. The kids will be like 45 by then. It'll yeah. be great. Um, hopefully you all learned something about the 1930s. If not, 
well, you're smarter than us. Um, if you have anything you want to tell us, if you want to talk about some inventions we missed, if you want to just say hello and talk about chocolate chip cookies, mm. go ahead and email us at unprofessionalengineering at gmail.com. And until next time, you could also send us chocolate chip cookies. See ya.